Welcome, everybody, to Dispatch Radio. I am your host, Russ Rizzo. Before we jump into a very fun discussion with Hillary Allen, Rhea Coble, and Chris Mendoza, I want to let you know about upcoming chances to come see us live along the Front Range. We'll be back at Upslope Brewing in Boulder for a special Valentine's Day show next Thursday night featuring Crusher Couples. We'll talk with pro ultra runners Avery Collins and Sabrina Stanley, downhill mountain bike world champion Miles Rockwell, and two-time world championship cross-country bronze medalist Willow Rockwell, as well as one of the founders of Upslope Brewing, Danny Page, and his wife Leslie, who met on a glacier in Patagonia. Then on February 19th, we'll be back at the American Mountaineering Center in Golden, featuring more Crusher couples, along with our partners with Golden Mountain Runners and Colorado Mountain Club. On March 6th, we then head to Highlands Ranch in South Denver to do an OCR night with Chris Mendoza and Rhea Coble, featured on this episode, at Manic Training with our partners at Athlete on Fire. And lastly, tickets go on sale soon for our next Rare Air Talk. We're calling this one CBD 101 for Athletes. We'll be at the Studio Boulder with some incredible incredible pro athletes and experts on CBD. Tickets and details to all of that at dispatchradio.com and also on our Facebook page. Now on to the show. PV equals NRT. I wanted to say that earlier. Oh my God. That is the, I, the ideal gas, gas law, everyone. Yes. The ideal oh gas law. We have yes, nerds in the room. I know the roaches are loving this. Yeah. I was like, oh my lord, I can't believe, first of all, that you're alive, and then able, like you said, to run again. Just even to run, to walk. It sounds like what Rhea has adopted is the Courtney DeWalter training program. That was the flat first time I had heard a helicopter since the rescue, and I just like got down to the ground and started crying, and I couldn't control it. Hey guys, thank you for coming. My name is Russ Rizzo. I'm the host here at Dispatch Radio, one of the founders. We're sitting in Upslope Brewing with three really incredible endurance athletes and some friends uh, here at Upslope. We're excited to record. Yeah, with some friends. Just a quick shout out uh, to a couple of hashtag FOTS, friends of the show. We've got Sarah Grome with Open Door Real Estate. She's been a supporter of Dispatch Radio, and we love her. Got David Roach and Megan Roach, who are, uh, and I think all three of you probably are very familiar with the Roaches. Is that right? Of course. I have no idea who they are. I actually finally got to talk to them in person today, and that was pretty cool. <laughs> Chris Mendoza be, uh, being facetious. Uh, we've got Jeremy Hendricks in the house with La Sportiva. This guy is uber talented, guys. Nicole showed up on time. Nicole? <laughs> Nicole, Nicole Miracle. It's a miracle she showed up on time. Nicole, Nicole showed up. Miracle. We were all shocked. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. We're excited. Something that's interesting about all three of you is you're all super smart. It's really crazy. Uh, you know, we recorded with David and Megan Roach at the Boulder Running Company a couple weeks ago. You know, and I was talking about, you know, David's a lawyer. He's got a law degree. Uh, Megan's, you know, got a medical degree. I mean, the three of you are equally impressive as far as the academic credentials and discipline. None of us are doing in. anything with it. <laughs> Except for this guy. Ray is just a dropout, okay? <laughs> Rhea, the dropout. So, Rhea uh, Koble, you're from Slovenia. You have just shot onto the OCR scene. I mean, where did my magazine go? There we go. If you guys haven't picked up this the uh, this month's Trail Runner magazine, there's Rhea on the cover. Uh, you've just shot to the forefront. You're a, a world champion OCR competitor. You're on the Spartan Pro team. You're a two-time uh, world's toughest mutter champion. Uh, and I was interested to learn you're, you are also a very competitive gymnast as a young girl, really starting from age six till 17. You were a very competitive gymnast in your home country of Slovenia. Your background is in engineering. Is that right? Yeah. Material science and engineering slash other stuff. <laughs> Material science and, and other stuff, uh, UC Berkeley uh, and Stanford. So we'll get into a, a little bit about that. Chris Mendoza to your left, uh, for folks that want to hear Chris's full story, we have a profile in motion. I went out running with Chris on his local running trails out in Golden and learned all about his story. So folks that are tuning in now that want to hear more about Chris's story, you know, certainly check that out. But for those that haven't listened, dentist, anesthesiologist, 
World champion OCR competitor. He won the 2018 World's Toughest Mudder competition. Also relatively new to the sport of OCR. Went to UCLA. Is that right? Yep. Um, did your dental residency and a recent addition to Golden somewhat thanks to Ray. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, I kind of had an opportunity after residency to go wherever I wanted to and uh, was able to connect with Rhea and she showed me a lot of the trails out here. And uh, I took him on a Skyline Traverse when he came from sea level. First run <laughs> ever. This guy comes into town from sea level and you're like, let's go do a 16 mile and, and tick off six mountains in the process. It got him to move here. So. <laughs> That's true. It was a horrible day. It was a horrible, great day. One thing that we covered in the profile that we might touch on today is how you got into OCR because it, it does resonate with many people. Uh, you had a pain in your life. Uh, you had a loss in your life. You were looking for an outlet and you found that, oh gosh, the longer I run, the more I feel like I'm working this stuff out. So isn't that interesting? And to your left, we've got Hillary Hilly Goat Allen. Uh, newly booted, by the way. So for our podcast audience, can can uh, Chris, can you take a shot at what we're looking at here? Yeah, Hillary's right foot is in a boot, and she's got some nice crutches she's been going out on. Uh, her for surgery tomorrow. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to channel my inner obstacle course racer with training with the crutches. And um, <laughs> yeah. also, he's an anesthesiologist, so maybe he's going to help me out tomorrow. He <laughs> might. He, he, he calls himself. That's all I'm asking so many questions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How much do I weigh? How tall am I? <laughs> yeah. You got it all dialed in? You ready? Yeah. Just, all right. Hey, if you got Chris by your side going to surgery, I mean, you're feeling confident, right? Oh, yeah. So, uh, Hiller, I, I'm sure that lots of our listeners are very familiar with your backstory, but just quickly, A, you're primarily a scientist. Is that right? Yeah. Is that, did I get that right? Okay. So she's not primarily an ultra runner, even though you also crush at the ultra running. Uh, you've got a long list of accolades uh, of your running career. You're a sky runner. You, I think you still currently hold at least one course record. Is that right? Somewhere. You don't even know. You don't keep track. Um, but you kind of, you got into the sport as a grad student yeah. and really just kind of took off. You're sponsored by the North Face. You're able to do this professionally, and you also part-time teach at a college. Yeah, so I teach part-time like anatomy and physiology, chemistry, biology. But, yeah, I, I say that I've been a scientist longer than I've been a runner, which is also, it's true. <laughs> a scientist since, like, Way back, you consider no, yourself the womb. I think like both my parents are scientists. In, in our profile, in most in our run with Chris, one thing we talked about was that you kind of have these dual roles. You you have the full time career as an anesthesiologist, and you have this OCR, and they're at this point kind of equal passions. I'm wondering, Hillary, are, do you feel the same way? Do you like are you just as jazz when you're in a classroom teaching as you are when you're out running? Absolutely, I think. Um, the one thing, well, I think curiosity uh, kind of bridges both science and running. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure like Megan can understand that. I mean, she's you know she's a doctor, so I mean it's very science heavy. And probably Ray, you can understand this too. It's like uh, I think that's what drew me to running is this curiosity of figuring out how far my body could go. And those are the same questions you ask for a, a scientific question: is how does this system work? And you kind of do the experiments to to figure that out. And that's the same everywhere. And so I get really excited on a trail when I'm running um, and also really excited during a class when I'm teaching gas laws. Like, I really like it. And it's like... Gas law? What is, yeah. a, what is a law of gas? What's one I mean, of the laws? Like, did anyone go out and like start their car this morning and their tire pressure gauge was low? That's gas laws because it's colder air. Like, you're basically little particles, the gas inside your tires, not totally like make like it's not pressurized it's not as highly pressurized so so you're just <laughs> always thinking about the science behind just everything yeah, around so and, and yeah. pretty much anyone who's you're like for, my five-year-old son jack thank you <laughs> that's <laughs> the biggest compliment it's ever. a huge compliment absolutely <laughs> but yeah like when i when i run i mean i try like i i literally am looking for anything like anything in nature bugs like that's my favorite but i'm always thinking about like science when i'm when i'm running um yeah that's just how it's made and uh, so we mentioned the uh, Megan and David Roach who are here in the audience. We uh, had a great uh, you know time with them at the Boulder Running Company, as I mentioned earlier. 
And uh, one of the, the theme of the night was happy runners. I think tonight is like, you know, friendship, right? We got Chris and Rhea. Um, Rhea, I know that we, we've, we've covered a little bit, you know, that you and Chris are, are friends. You, you met through OCR competing. Is that right? I think the first time that we really hung out was that Skyline run. And then he still decided he's my friend after that. So <laughs> I feel like that one. Oh, so pretty if well. you run with somebody for, what did it take you? How long did it take you guys? Four hours. Four hours. Four hours. Yeah. Wow. So oh, just for reference, guys, I consider myself a pretty good weekend warrior. That thing took me six and a half. Okay. So uh, that's amazing. But you go for a run with someone for four hours and you're either friends. Or you're like, okay, yeah, I've, I've heard everything I need to know. Is that kind of how it works? Mixed yeah. emotions. Yeah. Definitely mixed emotions. <laughs> and you mentioned, Raya, that you've got an interesting story about Hillary. Yeah. Um, Actually, like Chris knows this, but you don't know I don't that. Know this. Yeah, no. Um, I love Strava, and I love chasing course records on Strava, and so yes, she I does. almost to a fault. <laughs> I knew, I knew Hillary, and I like follow her on Instagram, and I like when I moved here, I also looked at where people ran just to figure out where good routes are, and so then I saw that she set this course record and the loop that goes up Bear Mountain and then down the canyon, and I was like, oh, that sounds like a really fun loop. I want to see if I can break it, and so. I'm I'm running up the canyon and I'm dying and this comes this runner coming to me and I look up and it's Hillary and I recognize her and she recognized me and then we started chatting and I'm like thinking to myself shoot the like clock is running I need to go break her record I need to go so I think I used an excuse of like I'm cooling down I just need to get this over with oh my god that's really funny I didn't so know that. yeah that was our first in-person interaction I had a radar. I knew you were going hunting. Yeah, she was like, wait, somebody, she was on Strava. She was like, wait, somebody's on my course. I got to take care of this. So don't leave us in suspense. I got it. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Harry, you, you've got some work left. But, but to, to, I think, like, she did, like, a 25-mile run, and that was, like, a four-mile section of it, and I went out for that four-mile section. So oh, okay. She cherry-picked a little bit. <laughs> yeah. She's just trying. So y'all y'all might be familiar with uh, Golden Hell Week. It's something that uh, Jeremy's uh, colleague, Quinn Carrasco, helps put on. Uh, with the Golden Mountain Runners, obviously in Golden. It's Golden Hell Week. Uh, and I did the exact same thing. I ran all the routes slowly, you know, just leisurely having fun. But there, he allowed, he, he does some segments where like downhill segments where you get, and I, yeah, I put on the, the charge for that. So I got a similar kind of strategy. Um, Hillary, your, your profile, it's interesting. Um, we did a, an interview with Quinn, um, Brett the other day, the other week. Um, and it's interesting, this, this thing that happens, you get injured and then you get all this attention around the injury. Um, and I'm just wondering, well, first we should probably just kind of fill our listeners in. You had a horrific accident, um, what, two years ago? I'm sorry about the one on Thursday. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, not quite like 18 months ago or so. 18 months ago, you <laughs> fell 150 feet. Yeah. Uh, basically off a cliff yeah. uh, in Norway while competing um, and miraculously are here talking with us alive. Yeah. Uh, and not only that, you got back to running in the past 18 months. And not only that, you got back to winning <laughs> in the past 18 months. I mean, that is truly remarkable, is it not? I don't know if it's remarkable. I feel like I didn't really have a choice. Like I, I, I couldn't walk. Um, I was forced to kind of question if I could run again. I mean, I think everyone pretty much knows this, but I don't really like being told what to do or what I can't do. And um, I basically had no other choice but to, to try and to keep going. And um, I guess that was, that was the outcome of just not giving up actively every day, even though I wanted to. Um, I, maybe some say it's like, impressive or spectacular, like an amazing recovery or comeback. But I disagree because I think it's, it's when pushed to extreme limitations, you find a way to survive. And I think anyone in my position would have found the grit to continue going. Well, and it's crazy because I'm fairly new to like the ultra running scene, I guess. I started in OCR kind of like you mentioned. And uh, when I started kind of in getting into ultra, ultra running and just kind of like following the sport, her story was actually one of the first stories I had actually ever heard um, on a podcast. And I was like, oh my Lord, I can't believe, first of all, that you're alive. And then able, like you said, to run again, just even to run, to walk 
from what you went through was like like truly inspirational. I was just like, this is amazing. And it also made me kind of want to try a sky race, but then like at the same time be like, but be careful. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's usually, yeah, I know you said today when you're running on the ice, you're thinking of me. I'm so happy that I can, you know, be everyone's safety reminder. (laughs) You're keeping us safe out there. Just to give you guys context. So just, (laughs) uh, she broke, she had two broken ribs. Uh, three, fract- actually. Three, okay. I mean, I can do the laundry list. It, like, Go for it. <laughs> I broke... You know better I, than me. Yeah, yeah. I broke, like, th- uh, 14 bones in total. Like, so my L4, L5, which is, like, essential. I mean, it, I, I'm lucky to not be paralyzed. Um, yeah, that's, like... And that's also when, your, like, nerves innervate to, you know, make your legs move. Pretty important. Um, and then three ribs, broke both bones in my wrists. Well, like, arms, so both, like, radius ulna in both arms. Um, several, I think three, four bones in my foot. I'm forgetting some. And then, um, I tore a major ligament in my foot. Didn't, you know, break any bones in my legs. I saved that one for last Thursday. And what happened last Thursday? I don't know. I'm really angry about it. So (laughs) I might cry or start punching something. I don't know. Um, I basically like, no, nothing. Like literally I'd already finished the trail portion of my run and I was four blocks from my house on a road and I slipped on some ice. And as I like was slipping and all your weight, you know, is on one foot. I just heard a pop as my foot kind of, it was like kind of like extreme supination, I think to the fibula and I broke it. Yep. You're going into surgery tomorrow. Yep. Chris is helping me out. Wait, are you really? No. Oh, no. <laughs> Be there when Rhea is tomorrow. very gullible. AM? You, you free? Not AM, PM. Oh, okay. I'll probably be done by then, yeah. 1345. Oh. You got your own personal anesthesiologist. That's pretty cool. Yes. That's pretty cool. So OCR ultra running, there are a lot of similarities and there are some differences. The main difference is bird arms, I think. If you look at Rhea's you know, cover shot, you know, OCR competitors have some muscle on them and they have to. For those are un- uninitiated, Rhea, what OCR, Spartan Race, Tough Mudder, we've probably all heard about these things. We see them on TV now. Can you just kind of just break down like some of the obstacles or just some of the things that they throw at you in these races? Yeah, um, it's actually a lot like trail running, but then you do stuff in between. So there's monkey bars set up on top of mountains. You carry buckets up and down a hill, usually the steepest hill. They can find sandbags um, rolling under barbed wire in the mud. Um, yeah, just things like that. A lot of grip strength, a lot of full body strength, and it really breaks down the run, um, which I think in one sense makes it a bit easier because you can you know, bring your heart rate down, but then you're also a bit more tired because you're doing other stuff in between. It breaks down, it breaks up the run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, Hillary, does any of that appeal to you? This this monkey bars and carrying sand up a hill, like does that sound fun? Um if I had better grip strength, maybe. Okay. Um, ask me after this stint with the crutches. Um, but no, I mean, I like races to, that use all of my, I really like fourth class scrambling or I'm using like all of my limbs, you know? So I think that there's some appeal to that. And definitely like I have a background in, in tennis and um, just, you know, like ball sports, like using your whole body. So, I mean, there is definitely some athletic appeal to that. But yeah, I think it's, I think it's different. Cause like, I mean, it's, it's easy quote unquote to like to run for, you know, two hours up, up, a trail but it's also like a different beast to be able to you know run for two three hours but then intermittently have to like jump over things or do a bunch of burpees like well it's funny that you say that like it's easy to just go running for two hours because I had the exact opposite like beginning like I hated running and the reason I liked obstacle course racing is because you you were breaking it up (laughs) and it was just like okay you just have to run in the next obstacle and run in the next one yeah But I think now I've kind of transitioned to that point where I do love just like spending hours and hours in the mountains now. I think it's like the sky running too. It's like there's some similarities to it. That's why I like sky running because it's not just running. Like if I were to run like just on a flat trail for hours and hours and hours, I think I might get bored. But some people love that. That's just not my style. So I like to have something that mixes it up a little bit where you can kind of go to these ridges and traverse across them without falling off. That's the best way. But They're running 100 miles in these OCR. So they're doing a hundred miler, but then they have all this other stuff going on. And to me, I'm like, well, that's way harder because they're using all their muscles. But Chris is like, no, actually, my 
might actually make it a little easier. For like a neuroscience perspective, that's what I have like my, ma- my master's degree in. And I think it makes sense because when things get hard for me in a race, wh- however long it is, I always narrow it down to that one moment. So one step at a time. So being able to kind of be, okay, I'll have to get through this obstacle or just this loop, right? It, they're loop courses from my understanding, right? So, I mean, so you have a series of 25 obstacles in like five miles and you have to get through each one. So it, so it focuses you and then time just passes. And for these like loop races too, it's, it's kind of nice because you do one five mile loop like over and over and over again. And then eventually you figure out where you eat. Like, is there like a water section that's really slow? And so that you have your waffle there or like where like you jump off of a cliff. And so that kind of breaks it up like in. You half. jump off of a cliff? Yeah, there's a yes. 35, 40, 40 foot cliff. Like with a parachute or what? No, into the water. What? Into the water? <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, like into a the cliff water. jump into, into the water. The water. <laughs> Sorry. To a field. <laughs> they named it the hilly goat. Yeah, it's the hilly goat <laughs> jump <laughs> under the ground. No, but it's not 150. Hillary, foot, so. so Hillary was just trying to become an OCR competitor when she jumped off a cliff, right? It was the sponsor plug. Yeah. <laughs> I did want to mention, I, I mentioned some uh, friends of the show earlier. I did want to mention Don McLaughlin is in the, is in the house. Is, is Sean here too? And Sean, uh, so they're the co-founders of Pure Power Botanicals out of Steamboat, Colorado. We're doing a CBD show in late March. So if you guys are interested in the topic of CBD, definitely uh, check out our Rare Air Talk. that's going to be coming up March 22nd at Studio Boulder. We're going to have all kinds of experts. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to have samples. People are finding... Uh, lots of benefits for CBD. Recovery is a big one. And Hillary, I know that you, you, you've you come through a big recovery and CBD is something that you said uh, you used during the, for your recovery. Yeah, it was one of the few things as far, because I just, I was, I'm not a big fan of taking um, narcotics, <laughs> nor do I, like, I would not recommend it. Um, and like, and NSAIDs kind of impede bone healing. And since I was trying to heal a bunch of them, um, I was kind of surviving off of just like, you know, biting on belts or Tylenol. Um, so literally. I, oh yeah, I'm yeah. I mean, not really literally a belt, but like I would just like cut it out. Is what I was trying to say. Um, <laughs> bite on her arm, actually. I couldn't. There was a cat. I'm as gullible as a golden retriever. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, um, I just d- was trying not to take um, painkillers, just so I kind of knew where my where my body was at. But my foot was really painful, so I had like this topical kind of CBD cream. Yeah, I mean, from I'm a you know neuroscience research. There's been you know people doing having pain studies on how CBDs can affect um, conditions like fibromyalgia and like nerve pain, and that's kind of what I. Well, there was a lot of nerve damage on the outside of my my skin from like incisions and surgery. So it was really helping me with that. And I'm looking over at the audience, and I also see another uh, friend of the show, Todd Strecka, uh, who we were, I mentioned the Boulder Running Company event. We were out with Todd. He threw an awesome Trails in Motion film festival the other night at the Dairy Center. We had a really good time. So, Todd, thanks for coming out. Mentality. We've got neuroscience experts on hand. We've got Megan Roach, as we mentioned. we got Hillary, right? So I think this is a good opportunity to get into something that's really interesting about your background, Rhea, and something that you said you're comfortable talking with. You grew up a competitive gymnast. Uh, I think you started at around age 6 till 17, so quite a long career uh, as a gymnast. You competed as, on the national team in Slovenia, and something really weird happened to you when you were around 17. Yeah, um- um, I actually had to quit because I had a mental breakdown, not because of any injury or anything like that, even though it's kind of swept under the rug as that, um, as a, as an injury. But it's, so what ended up happening was I had a couple of bad falls leading up to that. And I think my brain kind of figured out that what we're doing is pretty dangerous. And so I started losing my muscle memory. So one day I would know how to do everything. The other day I wouldn't be able to do a handstand. And it was kind of just standing there, not even knowing how to, put my hands down on the floor, which is quite a far cry from like a double pikes back with triple turns. Um, and so right before the Beijing Olympics qualifier, I was supposed to compete there. And there was like a meet right before that where I did really well. And then my coach said, don't come, don't come to the gym like again until we leave. But I came the next day and I like fell again and I lost all of my muscle memory. So I couldn't do like anything anymore. And we like tried, maybe it's going to go away, but it didn't. And I still, like, I still 
when I try and visualize things that I used to know how to visualize, I see myself crashing and it's kind of like my brain completely forgot how to do all of that. And a lot of it never came back. It's pretty common in gymnastics. And I think like the current theory is that you learn things when you're little in blocks. And then when you, your brain tries to separate that in one thing after another, there's just no nerve connections that have that memory. And so you're trying to access something that's not there. And then you forget how to do everything. And so actually I still, like, I can do certain things that some people will never forget doing. And it's just kind of like it's wiped, erased. Any insights on that? You did a very good analogy of like how, how your brain kind of like stores, stores memories. I mean, I'm thinking of like muscle memory from like in your cerebellum, like, um, you know, me learning tennis like that's in my muscle memory or like riding a bike like those are certain things that you it's like you'll never forget like you get on them and your, your body kind of knows what to do walking running is in that as well there's a certain I mean like David's a coach Megan's a coach they I think like a lot of their training I was coached by David and he would tell me he's like oh just run and like if you're running faster like that builds kind of this muscle memory so your body just kind of knows what to do at a certain pace but like trauma when that goes into it it's a completely different situation i mean you have your whole like you know i'm not i should i'm gonna like go off on these like little tangents but i mean like your amygdala and it's just basically like your rept reptilian brain it's this like fight or flight mechanism so you want honestly when you receive like a stress signal sometimes your body can take it as a good stress like if it's something you're used to doing like going into you know if you're going into a race like it's it's the same feeling as if you're maybe getting attacked by a bear but you're actually familiar with that stressor for a race like you feel like you're you feel focused like you have a little bit of adrenaline but you're kind of in that like fight mode but in a good way um but sometimes your body can get confused if like that same, what used to be kind of a good pathway is now, was now stressful. Um, that's like what I'm dealing with, with, you know, my fall or, or like slipping, right? Like fear of something that was, you know, a, a emotion that I was completely comfortable with and now having some instability or insecurity around that. But it's like nothing that you can control. It's all in your brain and how it's like mixing up signals. Yeah, sorry if I'm getting too personal, but then how are you able to like go out and do these runs after you've had such like a crazy event like that? Like how, how are you processing it when you're out on a, a big run, especially like with, you know, sketchy terrain? Yeah, it's, um, it's been a process. Um, every day is definitely not perfect. Um, it took me a while to be able to get up the courage to go on a ridge that had exposure. Um, and still I feel very, um, aware, like hyper aware of, okay, I'm maybe not on the cliff, but I know that there is that there. And like, I feel just very kind of just on, on uh, like hyper, hyper aware, just like my senses are kind of off. Um, but I will say I've had some pretty intense like PTSD moments where I was on a trail in South Boulder and it was the Mesa Trail and they were doing practice with helicopters for like the fire rescue. And that was the flat first time I had heard a helicopter since the rescue. And I just like got down to the ground and started crying and I couldn't control it. So thankfully I wasn't in like a bad situation then like, you know, up on a technical ridge. Um, but yeah, and some days it's not perfect. Like some days when like there's bad weather um, I just get this kind of gut feeling and I just turn around. Um, so I still deal with it. Um, and I'm still like, I'm kind of in that same spot now. Um, because this was just kind of a freak accident and I'm again, like stupid slipping on the road. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I'm asking why, but it's kind of a question that I will never know the answer to. Um, you guys are scientists. The only answer is second law of thermodynamics. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like a walking example. Perfect. Yeah. And that was my favorite class in chemistry. So like, you know, that's coming to bite me in the ass. Um, but uh, and it's just, I don't want fear um, to stop me from doing what I love. Um, so, I mean, it's not easy. It's definitely hard. And I think it's something that I'm going to have to tackle again. And I wasn't actually done dealing with it the, from the first time. So, um, I mean, from a personal perspective, I don't think that anyone would expect you to <laughs> in like such little time, especially, or even for the rest of your life. Like when I heard you were running again, I was amazed and just like to hear what you're doing now again, it just like makes me question like how you can go back on those trails. I mean, kind of just talking about how like, I mean, Rhea kind of just couldn't 
do the things she used to be able to do because of like one bad incident. It's it's just crazy. It was actually like multiple, or like multiple. one bad, and then you forget, and then you fall on your head <laughs> all the time, and then your brain is like, "This is dangerous. We're gonna shut it down." So one it's way or a protective instinct. I think so. Yeah. It's like your brain's like, "No, you you're not gonna be doing this anymore." A lot of the times, like mid air, I didn't know what to do so you stop and then you land on your head not your feet and then like i just kept on doing it and i think my brain was like this is we're done <laughs> you're doing something else so now i'm always on my feet <laughs> and you mentioned there's still things to this day that you don't have muscle memory of. yeah i can do anything so a lot of gymnastics things are you start running forward you do a flip and then you keep moving backwards I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to flip forward motion into backward motion anymore. I'm fine doing like stuff off of trampoline, like all backwards or all forward, but I don't know anymore how to do the transition. Like my brain doesn't have that connection anymore. And she remembered how to do the running beforehand. Just oh in yeah, case I remember that. <laughs> she, she could do that still. So you had this crazy mental breakdown, as you call it. And then what? And then... um I got really fat. I got really unhealthy. Does anybody in this room believe that Rhea used to be fat? You should see the picture books. I gained they are 40 incredible. pounds in two weeks, and I'm not exaggerating. Um, I just I had a life mission to eat all the ice cream I never had. And then I started running because I couldn't like walk up a hill anymore. So I was just so unhealthy that it was not fun anymore. So what was the ice cream flavor that did it? Oh, all of them. <laughs> It didn't matter. <laughs> Chocolate, ice cream, cookies, everything. Right. Yeah. Uh, move us forward. How did? How, where? Where did the OCR? Where did the obstacle course racing come in? Um. Well, I moved to the United States and I lived in the Bay Area, and it was just beautiful there. So running was kind of easy because it was nice. It was a break from studying, and it was just a stress release. <laughs> um. And I started doing a few trail races, but I don't like running with people. So like a trail race was the first time that I actually ran against other people, and I didn't know I was fast until. I did it. Um, and so then I started doing more and more ultras because it was kind of what I liked better. Um, and then OCR kind of, I think it was on a Groupon and we did it for fun. And it really, the gymnastics and running kind of blended together perfectly. You really should be sponsored by Groupon. <laughs> Actually, I ran with my, it was my then boyfriend, now husband and three other guys. And I wanted to run as a team because I thought it would be way more fun. And they're like, we're not waiting for you. And then I think I beat them. I beat my husband for two hours, and he's refusing to run one since. Um, and I think I beat everybody else by like half an hour. So <laughs> you do it for fun, and then you discovered that you're just really well adept at this these obstacles. And it's very similar to gymnastics too, where you can like train for seven hours a day if you want to, because there's always other things to be doing. So it's like you can run in the morning, and then you can hang on a bar for like two hours if you want to, and it's not gonna cause injury, but it's making you better. And she likes that part of it <laughs> to where it's like, yeah, I could work out all day long. Most people are like pick the sport where it's like, yeah, I can only do two hours a day and then call it. No, no, no. She picks the one where she likes to work out. Co-host Kelly McConnell swears that if she didn't have to have gainful employment, she would just work out all day. She just loves it so much. That's kind of what I do now. <laughs> Hillary, uh, what, what about you? I like to do other things. I mean, I do, I do like that. Um, but yeah, for running, I think it's like if I... There's only so many five-hour runs I could go on before I'm just like, okay, I need a little bit of a break. Plus, my version of like a five-hour run is probably like stoppage time searching for insects. So it's not really a five-hour run. <laughs> but working out, I don't mean like I'm in the gym all day. I like go skiing and I call that training because you're using poles. So it's upper body. <laughs> Anything that's moving. <laughs> yeah, like just being out and like doing stuff. And you can justify everything being OCR training. Like I can carry groceries and say I'm working out. <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit about just how you guys make this work. So, you know, Chris, you're a dental anesthesiologist, so clearly you've got a career that then supports your ability to go, you know, fly across the world. You've got a little flexibility in your job to be able to go to Australia and compete. He also wakes up at 4 a.m. every day. And you wait, is that you have a 4 a.m. rule? Pretty much. I mean, most of the time we end up start working at like 6 a.m. or maybe even earlier. Usually I'm at work by 6, and uh, which is good because then by about 2 o'clock I'm usually done with work. I thought you were going to be like another like morning person. Rhea doesn't like the mornings. I oh, know. I hate mornings. I love the mornings, but like I wake up too early. Like I, I'm not going to wake up at 2 a.m. to go run in the morning. 
Oh, like, yeah, that's a little extreme. Yeah. I'd be like, five is fine yeah, for four. Fine. Another friend of the show, Travis Macy, has the 4.30 a.m. rule. It's in his book. It's like, you know, hey, if you're trying to achieve big things, just give it a shot. I feel like I do just the same as everybody else, just like shift it a few hours later <laughs> when it's warm and sunny and... Not cold and freezing. And Rhea, you're uh, kind of on the, on the other end of the spectrum. You, so you were in a PhD program thinking, you know, I'm going to do science. You were going to be an engineer. Was that the idea? I was in PhD for physics. For physics. Um, yeah. And you start doing the OCR. You start doing well in competition. You decide, hey, I'm going to go for this thing. I think just growing up, sports were always making me happy. I was good in school and it was interesting, but it was always a second thing to do. Um, so when an opportunity came to do this full time, and I, I know it's not forever lasting so I'm kind of doing it right now and people are like oh you should like do less so you don't get injured because you want to do this forever but I don't really want to do it forever I want to do it now and I want to do it full out now and then once I'm done I'll go do something else. So you are just full gas then you're just plunging you know head into it. Hillary you're you're a bit of the kind of in-betweener right because you do have the part-time the the profession. And um that makes me like you even more about like the physics thing. Physics is like my favorite thing, second to chemistry. <laughs> PV equals NRT. Yeah. I wanted to say that earlier. Oh that is the, I, the ideal the gas, gas law, law, everyone. Yeah. The ideal oh gas God. law. We have you nerds in the room. I know the roaches are loving this. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, I mean, like I'm the same way. I mean, I definitely want to be running for a long time. I know that competition isn't isn't um, isn't going to be for be there forever, but I want to be able to have balance so I can kind of do. I, especially when injury came, like it was nice to have something else to do. Um, I struggle when everything is kind of wrapped up in, in running. Um, but that's just me. I think I got into the sport a little bit later in life. Chemistry and science is really important to me. So being able to find a way to incorporate that into, into my life is really important. Um, as well as other things, like it's not just that it's like, it's writing, it's more creative, like creating something rather than just kind of consuming and finding a way to kind of give back is something that I think is really important to me for balance. But it's also, it's kind of cool. It's like a fun experiment. You can kind of figure, figure it out what makes you happy. And like you find, I find new interests and then you can kind of explore them and see where they go. And if you can, can incorporate them in one way, then that's awesome. Is there pressure with that? I mean, do you, do you worry that sponsors, you know, oh, I won't be able to win a race now that I have my ankle broken for a little while? No, I mean, honestly, for me, I don't, I never got into running for the competition. Um, I got in. I was actually scared to do a competition because I didn't want to burn out like I did for tennis. And so it was really important for me to guard that. And um, so whenever I run, it's always just like a celebration of, okay, yeah, like this is a cool goal. Like I get to explore these cool mountains in this terrain. Um, but that's always secondary for me. The, the, the primary thing for me is making sure that I'm happy first and that is separate from competition. And so I think it was cool for specifically this injury is to kind of even prove to sponsors that my value is actually outside of of competition. And I think that's really important for all athletes because I think that's what's super important about this community in general is that, yeah, it's great. Like we get to push ourselves to the extreme at these competitions. We want to do well and we're going to battle it out and gut it out. But at the end of the day, we're all human beings and we all have different, like it's this human, human, humanistic aspect to it. And to humanize someone, um, I got to explore that through a pretty extreme way, but I think it proves that there's value outside of just strictly competition. But when you say competition, I I know you kind of mean in like an event, but it seems like you're also really competitive, like with yourself. I don't know. What do you think about that? We've we've seen your Strava. What? I only joined Strava like a year ago, which is kind of ironic because like when I did these things, like I joined Strava to be like, okay, like I can run. Like I was literally doing it to track my recovery because like I thought I was like no longer a runner anymore. Um, so, anyways, yeah, I am co- like I'm competitive with myself. I mean, I think that's like why I wanted to be a scientist and like, you know, push all these boundaries. So it's definitely internally driven, but it's not, it's not like, I don't need someone else to like give me a, like a gold medal if I, if I like knew that I tried my best. And you know what guys, this sounds a lot like a book that I have on my, on a, on a coveted portion of my shelf right now. Uh, the happy runner, uh, <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. is, that's, that's the whole deal right there is yep. be internally motivated. Oh, yeah. Don't be motivated by winning a race because you're going to win the race and you're going to be like, now what? 
Yeah, exactly. And is that, do you credit like your coaching with David as, did that help or did, were you already there with that philosophy? I think that's why like we connected on the first place. Like I think that that's super important to have that drive internally because if, if, if it goes away, like then what? Like if you're not happy in the first place, then what do you really have? And you can only like chase that for so long. Um, so absolutely. I mean, I think that's why like David has such like a good following of, of athletes and people. And it's because, I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's true. And definitely in like, in my injury, it was an opportunity to explore that. And of course, like I was mad and sad and angry and all of that, but it's like an opportunity to, to figure out, okay, well, like what, what am I besides a runner? And there's a huge laundry list for me, but and for anyone. I want to open up to, to the three of you. What what are you like? What are you interested in about Hillary and her world, and, and vice versa? I've got a question. If I wanted to train for an OCR race, should I like coat my living room in barbed wire and like <laughs> crawl around in my crutches? That sounds great. <laughs> I'm sure all OCR athletes. We, that's that's actually how our house is. Yeah. Like. Okay. I thought yeah, so. we just have barbed it's a wire everywhere. Buy, yeah. Really? And we also we just have climbing. Like uh, holds all or over the wall. You can also just make it so messy; it's an obstacle course. <laughs> That's kind of what I'm going That's for. Worse. No, but for real. So if like if I'm so again like you know I'm always problem solving. If I'm gonna be like not using my legs, like what are some good like upper upper body stuff? I want to get good at pull ups. My bird arms are screaming to yeah, yeah. Get hanging in hanging in pull ups, and then just do a race and figure out what you fail, and then work on that. <laughs> That's kind of like really the easiest way because there's ten million thousand things that you can work on, and it's hard to figure out what to do. And one thing that I've seen, um, if you don't like working out in a gym, if you can run and if you can like try to rock climb, um, whether it's indoor or whatever, um, Nicole's a super good rock climber and she does amazing in OCR. So and I've seen her carry buckets up and down Sunita's. It's quite impressive. <laughs> is, that, is this right? <laughs> carry You're buckets a up lunatic. and down Sunita's. I mean, so like, yeah, you could also carry heavy stuff too. Um, Gosh dang, that's crazy. Grocery shop for all your neighbors. You can care about <laughs> so, so, so grocery shopping, running, and rock climbing. Rhea, when you say hanging, you literally mean just... Just hanging. Like Hold hang on to a thing and hang. Like with your finger? Not even. Like just find a bar, go on a playground, and hang. Go on a playground and hang. All right. Time, time to get swollen. I'll, I'll just, you know, knock the kids out of the way. It's cool. <laughs> That's actually I've what, what, what it is. Actually, so they join it. in and they yeah. think it's fun. Yeah. She's like, she's like, I need to get on the bar. And she'll like nudge them over. <laughs> Nicely. That's what I do to kids in museums. No joke. Like if they're blocking the way and like playing around, I'm like, I'm reading this. Excuse <laughs> me. Hillary's at the bug exhibit. Like get the heck out of the oh, way. Oh, literally it happened. There's the firefly exhibit about like, yep. Firefly. I'm from Georgia. Those it's are pretty my jam. sweet. They're amazing. And it's science. Their kids like playing with the light up bugs, and I was like, "Move!" What, so, what what are the OCR folks? Uh, anything you're curious about on the ultra running scene, or? Yeah, I I feel like I run a lot, but you run like a lot, a lot, a lot more. So I'm just wondering how how do you like not get injured? I guess with that much running. <laughs> Not she, like, she barring, means overuse okay, injuries. Okay, barring, she like, means overuse yeah. injuries. Honestly, yeah, not, not, freak not like yeah, thank you. Um, I I I spend a lot of time in the gym. Honestly, like I read. I mean, I, like I said, I have a background in tennis, so strength training is really important. Um, I think like posterior chain, like strong hips and core. Um, so probably probably with like OCR, you get that. So, but I think every <laughs> every injury that I've seen or you know had myself has been like a. a core like a hip imbalance so as long as you keep those strong um yeah literally i'm in there not lifting heavy but like you know five times a week in the off season um but also on trails the beauty of it is is that like the miles are slower i know you were saying that that like it's more important for you like moving into 2019 like to run spend more time on trails and dirt but honestly like you know stress fractures and stuff like that's more like endocrine s s like system rather than like impact but um yeah i think it's just enjoying your time and like when you do a workout you know like you go fast and do that workout but then the rest of your run should be easy so it's really being disciplined in that um and you can put in a lot of hours and climb a lot of mountains as long as it's kind of like slow long endurance training I have a question for hillary actually oh <laughs> well because it seems like you do like all these technical crazy races like the sky races uh -huh. um do you have any interest in doing like like a flatter longer race like I mean, a, maybe like a western state something more runnable 
Well, I don't know. So like a more runnable race, but you seem yeah. to run really technical races. I like it. Like I said, it's like, it's like the puzzle, like problem solving. I really like, um, but I mean, it's so hard. Like it's a completely different beast. So, I mean, I could, I would, but it would have to be like a different training block. Like maybe, you know, after, after this, if I'm going to not be running technical terrain for a while, then yeah. I mean, I really do enjoy running, but it, yeah, it's, it's, like a different and really hard beast in its own way. Um, but I don't think it's out of the question. Like I do really love running. It's just, if I were to choose and be totally healthy, I'd want to try to scramble up as many ridges as I could. Yeah. I've just, I'm find, finding like difficulty trying to balance, like running some ultras, but also OCR. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like problem solving for training. Yeah. And so pick, maybe pick some ultras that would like, you know, complement the the training that you're doing for OCR I know some of the OCR races are like pretty pretty flat but some of them are up like at altitude um some of the Spartan races right yeah um Antique Big Bear is my favorite we literally went down Black Diamond around a stick and then we went back up the same way like five times oh yeah and then like the the world championship ones in uh Tahoe, in Tahoe. it's actually yeah. that one do is Broken the Arrow. same course as Broken Arrow yeah Exactly. So do Broken Arrow. There, there you go. go. Yeah, do Broken Arrow. With and you done. won't have to do the water obstacles, so it's a win-win. And it doesn't matter if it rains because nothing gets slippery. Uh, well, I'm going to wander my way into the audience here. Does anybody have a question for one of our guests? We've got Jeremy Hendricks with La Sportiva. I'm curious if for the OCR guys, if you can um, maybe shed some light on what you think the tipping point was for your sport to sort of give it this notoriety that we now um, you know, see, see it being... Um, more commonly shared on media, et cetera? I actually think it's the fact that it's accessible to everybody. Um, so there were races where I ran in the morning and then my mom um, ran like the same course, same thing in the afternoon. And so I feel like it's the fact that you can share, everybody does the same thing, some just do it slower than others. Um, I think that's why it appeals to such high number of people. Yeah, and I should mention that when Rhea and Chris both won the world's toughest mutter uh, last year, they it was on CBS, right? You guys and, and you and you were able because they broadcast it after the fact. You were able to have a little watching party. Yeah, we watched it at Ray's house. It we had fun. cereal, but it was bring your own. <laughs> it's it's pretty cool. So you can see Chris, and there's there's awesome photos. Uh, he limbo's under the finish line, and he's giving high fives. He's covered in mud. And he's got the American flag around the, and it's on national TV. That's pretty pretty cool. Actually, moment. that race you can stop anywhere between eight and noon, and so I was able to stop at nine. And so I went back, I showered, I took a nap, and I woke up, and he was still running. After I think it was after what ninety nine miles, he got in the lead in the last one mile. So that was a really epic event. And if you want to hear Chris tell that story, uh, check out that profile in motion. He, he takes us through the finish of that and for the notoriety do you mean like popularity too what got it to be as big as it was i think and there was like a documentary about this i think a lot of it has to do with social media not only the accessibility the, the ability to like go out and say like oh you don't actually have to run the 10 miles you can, you just kind of like jog to the next obstacle or hike to the next obstacle makes it super easy and then for a lot of these people who weren't really exposed to the outdoors i feel like it's an easy access point and then they can take a picture and they're like, look at what I did. I was like crawling under barbed wire. It looks super cool. And they show their friends. And like, I had friends who were doing it and that's how I got introduced to it. I was like, oh, that looks pretty awesome. You like go through this, you do monkey bars, you get muddy. It's going to be really cool. And I think that social media really helped explode the sport in that way. Megan Roach. Uh -oh. This one's for Rhea. So 